The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, this is Buffy Community Talk. Hopefully you are in the right room. Um, this, is, this talk is a fun little talk, but hopefully you'll get some community, open source community um, tips out of it also. Um, I'll start by giving you a little information about my background. Um, I'm a tech journalist. I, my area has always been Linux and open source. My first job in um, open source or Linux was at Sysadmin Magazine quite a few years ago, about 15-ish years ago. Um, and before that, I had worked in the fulfillment department working on all of our subscription management. Um, and now I'm at Red Hat, and I started at Red Hat in February as um, the community evangelist for the open source and standards team, which means I do their social media basically for a bunch of the up upstream projects. So my entire career, even though I haven't been in a specific community before now, I guess, um, this is my first non-publishing role, um, I've done a lot of observing. And so um, this talk is based on some of the observations I've had from Buffy, my favorite show, <laughs> and uh, communities, open source communities. Has everyone seen Buffy, the series? Is there anybody who hasn't? OK. I'll, I'll try to fill you in on any of the things that you need to know. And, uh, but I think you can, you'll figure it out as you go through this. But I didn't see it when it originally aired. The first time I saw it was on Netflix. Um, in the winter of uh, 2011, I was living in Lawrence, Kansas. We had a very cold winter, and I was in the middle of a divorce. So I stayed in and uh, plowed through all the Buffies. And then I watched it again the following winter because we had another really cold winter. In fact, that's the only time I missed a business trip was I got snowed in from uh, scale in LA. So that was even worse as I was missing LA and scale and I was snowed in. Then this past winter, I started watching all of them for the third time. Um, but then, and it was another cold winter and then I moved to Austin. <laughs> so I quit watching it in February when I moved to Austin and everything was much nicer. Out and I could get outside. But this winter, it was also funny, I decided to adopt a kitten, and I went in to adopt her in the middle of my third Buffy series, and um, the first kitten I saw was named Buffy. That's how I got Buffy. Oops, going the wrong way. OK, so um, here's a Joss Whedon quote, which I think nicely describes um, the feeling people get in open source communities also. You have a lot of individuals who are working on their specific parts of projects, but ultimately everybody is on some kind of a team or in some kind of a community. And um, even people I know in open source who like to think that they um, are antisocial, <laughs> you know, or uh, surly or whatever, they're always on some kind of a team and functioning in some kind of a group. So Buffy is the chosen one. She's the leader, obviously, of um, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series, and she's just a high school student. I've seen this a lot in open source communities. Um, even though open source, the essence of open source is collaboration, cooperation, you know, and everybody has a voice, ultimately the most effective communities tend to have some kind of a strong leadership um, you know, system, either a leader or a, a team board, you know, some kind of a group. Um, and I've, I've seen this quite a bit. In fact, um, a, a community I wrote an article about a couple years ago, no, I guess it was last summer, and they kind of have been rejuvenated, and part of it was um, stronger leadership and documentation, which I'll also get to. That's a big part of it. Um, but Buffy, she, she didn't volunteer, and you often see that too in open source uh, communities. It's not necessarily somebody um, who had a background in management or leadership. Sometimes it's just a natural person um, who is doing leadership you know, things, and everybody took steps back, and that person's left standing forward, and they are somehow running the show. Um, but she ends up learning a lot on the job, which you also see in, in open source communities. So effective open source community leaders um, also have to adapt in, in their communities. You'll see that they do a lot of mentoring. Um, and listening is a huge thing in open source communities. You don't tell your communities what to do. You help them figure out how they want to function and then the process they're going to set up you know, to get their, uh, their goals accomplished. Having a sense of humor is a, a huge part of open source, I think. 
um, people who don't have a sense of humor um, tend to not um, have leadership roles um, or last long. You have to have a good sense of humor uh, to, to last in open source and to have fun. I think most of us are here because it is something fun and we enjoy. We, you know, very few people get rich working in open source. Usually it's a passion of some sort. Um, confidence is going to help. I would say not all open source leaders are actually confident. A lot of them just appear that way, um, but actually, um, you know, it's more of a, I'll freak out when I get home, but I'm going to be okay in this IRC channel right now. <laughs> um, understanding what motivates your community members also is very important for leadership because um, some people um, want public recognition, whereas other people, you know, are trying to pick up specific skills, you know, to help them in, in a job, you know, and so um, there are various motivations for um, different community members. Um, a lot of open source projects end up having, uh, you know, specific programs for recognition also. Um, Ubuntu and um, Fedora, for example, um, both have uh, systems for recognizing contributions. Um, being transparent, obviously, is very important. Um, and being inclusive in open source. And then training future leaders is a, a big part of open source communities because generally you don't have the same leader in a project forever, you know, unless it's a benevolent dictator type person. <laughs> but um, most open source projects are, you know, have some kind of a turnaround. We, we recently had a, a switch in Fedora leadership and that was a, a nice process where Robin was ready to pass the torch, you know, and, and somebody had already been in the project for a while, so it's been a smooth transition. So the next part is documentation. And uh, as a journalist, obviously, I can't emphasize that strongly enough. But I think that you'll see that in a lot of the most successful open source projects. They also have some excellent documentation. Um, maybe it's not going to destroy the earth if you don't. But it could totally hurt your project, you know, not having documentation. Um, so some documentation tips are, you know, good readme or introduction. Uh, I, I've seen this as recently as a couple weeks ago when I was looking at a project and I wanted to know more about the project and it didn't actually have an introduction, you know, it was just you dive right in. So if you don't know the background of the project, you know, that, that's going to hurt the um, uh, path to entry for new, newcomers to your community. Having documentation online and with the download, um, screenshots and examples of code in use so that you can visualize it. it I definitely work best with visuals, not just text. Uh, links and references, you know, to find out more information um, because, you know, most projects are also connected to other projects and so having, you know, easy uh, access to the other projects is helpful. And help for the new users and users in mind are very closely related and having just change logs, that's a huge pet peeve of mine. It's much more functional to have a documentation that reads, that you can actually read through it. It's going to help new people get up to speed. And um, even people within the community, we're not going to have to thumb through, you know, figure out your little bits of information. If you have a nice organized document that, with an introduction, you know, and that walks you through the whole process, um, it's going to be much easier for the newcomers and then for ongoing membership. Willow um, is, from the beginning, for those of you who haven't seen the series, she is a very mousy character at the very beginning of the series. Very smart, um, young high school student and uh, definitely not a leader type personality. She would be the you know, one standing in the back and people wouldn't realize how smart she is necessarily until they get to know her. But she, um, I, I picked this quote from her in, in the series because I think it also describes open source very well. Uh, if, if you think of an intern, for example, who might be on an open source project, um, ideally, if, if you have an intern, you know, you're going to keep them. You know, that's, I think most people would like to have them stay on if they're a good intern. And this is what you see with Willow. You know, she ends up really enjoying um, her high school experience working with the, the Scooby uh, the gang or whatever, you know, um, which is the uh, Buffy's little group of crime fighters. And, and then instead of going away for college, she decides to stay locally and um, really devote herself to this team because it's a good fight. And uh, I think we see that in open source where people have interned, you know, and then even after going to college or um, going on to a different job, perhaps they still contribute to the open source project. In Willow's case, um, having mentors um, was fabulous. And she went rogue at some point. That's what this image, that's not a good episode. I mean, it's good, but it's, uh, it was traumatic. Um, <laughs> luckily, mentors were able to bring her back in, but she does become a, a leader. She's able to pick up um, bits of information, you know, and skills from different mentors. 
So here's uh, some mentoring myths, and um, I, I do have uh, some references at the end of the slides, and these slides will be online also. <clears throat> and uh, mentoring myth number one is that you have to find one perfect mentor. Um, I've had quite a few mentors over the years. I continue to find new mentors, and I've, you know, like I've said, I've been doing this for quite a few years now. And um, there, I don't think there is such a thing as one perfect mentor anyway. And the second myth, myth is that it's a formal long-term relationship. I've, I personally have never had a formal mentoring relationship or even somebody that I formally called my mentor, you know. But um, I do have um, specific, a couple of specific managers, um, a couple of editors have been strong mentors to me, um, several journalists, a couple of community managers, and so these are people that I've really been able to get, uh, you know, pick information from and then actually go to with questions or advice over the years. Mentoring isn't just for junior people. Um, I have a master's degree in journalism, but I still pick up new editing mentors all the time, you know, and I might not agree with everything, you know, but it's very helpful for me to see how other people are doing things and what works for them, and so I'm, I'm still always learning. Uh, I think if, you know, if we're not always learning, at some point you get bored and, you know, switch jobs or whatever, but um, mentoring isn't something you do just out of the goodness of your heart. Like I said, if, if you're mentoring interns, for example, ultimately you're getting stuff out of that too. You know, maybe you're improving your documentation because they're pointing out holes you have in it or, um, you know, you're actually training somebody who's going to be on your team and a contributor in the future. <clears throat> in um, open source, if you look through any of the uh, job listings, you know, for Linux and open source jobs, programming jobs, you see a lot of calls for uh, Rockstar developer um, or uh, the coding ninja or whatever, and I cringe when I read these because to me, I, I really don't want to work with rock star personalities. Uh, I don't want to have to, you know, fight people's egos on a project. I would rather work with people who, I mean, I like working with strong personalities, you know, but I, I uh, want to work with people who are good at working with groups and, um, you know, sharing responsibility and sharing credit for projects also. Um, Angel is Buffy's love interest early on, and um, I'll, I'm sorry to tell you she kills him at some point, but um, I don't want to spoil it for you, but you should have seen it by now. <laughs> and uh, I was really happy because he annoys me, and I was never, I've never been able to get into his spin-off series because he's so annoying. That's how much I don't like the Rockstar developer personality, I guess. Um, so yeah, rock stars tend to be expensive, high maintenance, unpredictable, attention-seeking, and they get credit for work that other people do. And um, so if you're ever doing a job listing and you are tempted to put Rockstar on there, I'd rethink it unless you have a giant budget <laughs> and you really want somebody who's, you know, out there getting all the attention. Um, open source communities tend to be more of like a band is how I picture them. And I used the Fedora community as an example. Um, I, I don't really notice, you know, Rockstar personalities in the Fedora community. Maybe if you're deeper in, there are some of those. But um, I, I really think Fedora is a good example of a community that, you know, shares uh, responsibilities and, um, and credit at the end, you know. And even when uh, RHEL 7 was released re recently, I saw several of the um, main developers on it, you know, um, or leaders on the project um, giving shout outs to Fedora, you know, the Fedora community, because um, Fedora is a good example of a, a community sharing in um, their successes also. And then also, um, open source communities, uh, generally, um, it, it's wonderful if you're also contributing to other projects, you know, and you see that in bands also, um, you know, where your musicians will go record on other albums. <clears throat> Spike is supposed to be a villain, I guess, at, at some point at, early on in Buffy. Uh, he's, he might be my favorite character. Uh, he and Willow are real close, um, but Spike, he is a good example of a former community member, open source community member. And um, sometimes when you see community members leave a, an open source project, you also see them leave um, very, um, on not good terms. You know, I, I, if you're lucky, they you know, are just moving on to a different project. But sometimes you see them leave and they'll be very verbal about why this was a bad community, not just for them, but why it's dysfunctional. And um, I think that's what happened with Spike. He, uh, is a nice human and he is driven out of a very unfriendly community to become a vampire and they welcome him into their community. So I think Spike shows us some nice examples of um, how you can lose community members 
um, not valuing contributions is, is a great way to lose community members. Um, I think open source communities now are better about recognizing contributions that in the past were taken for granted, documentation, for example, and um, uh, you know, fixing bugs, you know, that's actually a huge contribution. You know, anyone who's had to deal with a little tiny pesky bug, the one person who can fix it, that's a big contribution. Um, don't help community members improve. You know, uh, that's another great way to lose a community member if they're just getting criticism for how bad they are as opposed to getting, you know, uh, this could have been improved by doing this, this, and this, and some mentoring along the way. Um, you're going to scare community members off. Um, not recognizing efforts. Um, a lot of stuff goes on that isn't even noticed, and so it's very good if you're able to pick up and, you know, give props to people in your community for their efforts, even if they aren't huge successes uh, and they need to be polished. Um, fostering a hostile environment, you know, allowing trolls, you know, or uh, dysfunctional community members to stay in the community is a good way to scare off people. And um, do give them uh, all these reasons to move on to other projects because there are other projects that will be happy to have your community members if you're not going to, you know, work to keep them. Closely tied to all of this is Glory, and she um, is um, the big bad in one season. She's the most wonderful villain ever. She's horrible and awesome, and um, she's a great example of a toxic personality in a community. Uh, I, it, it's, I think almost every community has some kind of toxic personality and, um, you know, who's doing something to cause rifts within the community, and this is a, a, a great quote that really kind of sums up uh, her personality. Um, there's a, a, a wonderful presentation. I watched the, the video uh, this week actually online. It's Donnie Burkholz from Red Monk has given the talk several times, and so you can find various YouTube um, videos for it. And his talk is Assholes Are Ruining Your Project. And uh, so he talked about um, his experience on the Gentoo project and how they were able to track um, a drop off in commits to an increase in complaints about a couple of specific community members. And so this is a wonderful talk. I, I highly recommend that you see it because he points out that not only were these couple of people scaring away you know, people in the community and chasing them off, but then it takes a while for a community re to recover because they've already established a reputation at that point you know, for being hostile, even if it was just the one or two annoying people. Um, so to toxic personalities, there's um, I have a, a LinkedIn article here at the end also, that, but some of the highlights from the article um, was that they, they do distract from the goal. Uh, they become just a distraction on the project. They emotionally drain participants. Glory uh, actually sucked the brain energy out of people and just like made them brain dead, and, and that's kind of what toxic personalities can do to community. Um, they cause a lot of needless conflict, you know. It's just not something anyone wants to have to deal with. It's constantly putting out this, you know, one person who's causing uh, some kind of conflict. Um, they, do, they can slow down the, the progress on any kind of a project, and they, they chase off community members. You can have, you can lose quite a few community members over one, you know, bad personality on the team. Um, the article uh, that I, I linked to in here at the end, um, one, one way they um, talked about um, actually, it was, a, it was also a talk uh, at the end. It's a, um, some people at Google gave a talk on um, these toxic personalities. They call them poison personalities. And um, you know, one of the suggestions they had is learning to just ignore these personalities. I personally don't think you should ignore a toxic personality on a community ever. If you're, um, I don't think you immediately jump to kicking them off, you know, but I do think it's something that you um, work on addressing and you know, giving them a chance to uh, change their, understand what behavior is causing conflict and then change it. But I don't think that ignoring a, a toxic person is ever going to help your community. So Anya is another one of my favorite characters. And um, if you haven't seen the show, she, uh, the first image here is when she appears as a vengeance demon. And so she is, she would be an example of, of, of perhaps somebody who enters the community as a toxic personality, but actually is just a bad communicator, and once they um, have better communication skills, they're able to stay and be a functional part of the community, and even maybe endearing. Um, communications within communities, uh, open source communities, can be very tricky because often we don't even meet the people that we're talking to online and working with, right? And uh, I mean, I have community or uh, team members that are located all over the world or 
um, or if you're traveling, you know, you're just communicating in IRC or via email. And um, if you're dealing with people from different um, countries, you know, maybe the, their native language isn't the same language, you know, the, the communication is very different. Like I said, I'm from the Midwest and people there aren't direct. Um, they have to, they're just, it's weird. They do, they're very uh, flowery in the way they say stuff so that if you're not from the Midwest, you might not know what they're even actually saying. They might be saying, I really hate this. And instead it came out as, oh yeah, that's a really you know, nice effort or whatever. And uh, so that's you know, one of the um, common things you'll see. I, I, when I worked at Linux New Media, for example, you know, we're in the Kansas office, a new Kansas office, and the parent company was in Munich. And um, luckily we all liked each other, you know, uh, <laughs> because uh, Otherwise, and we were able to laugh about the communication differences, you know, and just the cultural differences. And we even would play jokes on each other, you know. Um, Americans are known for having guns everywhere, you know, and um, whereas Germans, you know, would stick in nude uh, statues as art in the magazine just to freak us out and be like, no, and then we'd realize it was a joke. They weren't really trying to, you know, but um, Americans seem to be more uptight about nudity and okay with guns. So, um, Anyway, those are some of the cultural differences. And so Anya really struggles with that in the Buffy series where uh, her conflict is often just because she doesn't communicate like everybody else. Um, despite having a communications background, um, I, can, I can really relate to Anya because I communicate great in writing and it's, it's in person that I tend to have um, my fallout. And um, <clears throat> so I, I collected some tips for communication um, for online and in person. Um, having one conversation at a time. Uh, I, I have that problem when I'm, um, you know, in in, uh, in person. You know, in, if I'm not just looking at that one person and other people are trying to talk, it's very hard for me to even, you know, ha to focus and have a conversation. So looking people in the eye is is a great way to do it in person. Um, but even online, I'm having challenges with that in IRC. You know, and um, where you're you're supposed to be keeping track of the community and then your work. IRC and then, you know, see, it's exhausting. And I, I don't know how to fix that yet for myself because I haven't really had to work on IRC before, um, you know, going to Red Hat. I've, I've avoided it. I've, you know, I knew about it and people kept telling me I needed to be there and I kept saying, no, that's not going to be good for me. Um, and I'm still, I, I have to figure out how to do that. Uh, in fact, I've had, I've had one colleague call me a couple times and say, did you not see the questions on IRC? No, I didn't. I was working. I don't know how you do this, you know. Um, writing things down, I have to write everything down. I can't just type it. If, if I need to remember it, I need to write it down, and that um, helps me remember whatever I've agreed to or talked about with somebody. Um, reading and responding to an entire email, I'm really bad about that. If it's a long email, um, I'll do a speed read and get a couple things out, and then I've actually missed major things, and I'll ask stupid questions later, and it was all in the email that I did a speed read on. Um, creating a response schedule is, um, one, one tip, I haven't done that yet. I, I think that's gonna be very good for me probably with email. And um, assuming best intentions. My, my very first job, um, even before I started at SysAdmin, but it was at Miller Freeman, which was the company that um, published SysAdmin when I worked in fulfillment. I remember my very first day on the job, the HR person who was giving me a tour, I, I just remember it stood out. She said, the culture here is that we always assume people have the best intentions. And that has really helped me my entire career. And um, I wish everybody would go into every conflict like that, even in IRC or, um, well, especially in IRC, I think, but uh, email and in person, you know, you see a lot of conflicts online where people assume somebody meant something a certain way, and that might, may not be it at all, or the way they said it. Um, you know, maybe that's what they meant, but then when they had time to think about it, that's not what they really meant to say. So assuming best intentions at the very beginning is going to help in any kind of a communication difference. And then closing the loop. Um, I have to do this after our conference calls. If we've agreed to do anything, I, I repeat back, or you know, in, even if we've had um, a conference call with Etherpad, it's also complicated, but uh, you know, then I'll be like, okay, these are the takeaways, right? This is what we've agreed on. This is, you know, who's doing what, and here's the deadline, you know, and, if, and putting that all in writing helps me close the loop and make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, Xander is a generalist, so he's uh, a high school friend of Buffy's and, and the whole gang, and 
he ends up not going on to college. He's kind of, uh, you know, right after high school, he doesn't go to college. And um, he kind of tries out some different things to figure out what he wants to do. And so he picks up a bunch of different skills, you know, but he doesn't really specialize in any one thing. He's not a witch like Willow, and he's not the slayer, you know, and um, he's not a, you know, former vengeance demon or a librarian or whatever. He's just still trying to figure it out. He's been a bartender and handyman and, and whatever. And so um, I, this, this quote was really um, very beautiful in the Buffy series. It was a very beautiful episode. He's comforting Buffy's sister who doesn't feel like she's, um, any of her contributions are recognized or appreciated, you know, and, and, uh, and it's, just, it's a very beautiful scene because he is saying, you know, that generalists um, aren't out in the open. They don't get seen, you know, they don't, um, people don't know what they're doing, you know, and uh, it reminds me of, I went to Cabo a couple summers ago with um, six nurses, and I remember we were all on the beach and some, you know, cute boy came up and was talking to one of them, and, and, uh, and she's like, yeah, we're all nurses, except for her. We don't know what she does. And that was me, you know, because I had said, I'm associate publisher of, you know, Linux Pro at the time. And they're all like, what? And uh, what does a publisher do? Well, <laughs> anything that anyone else isn't doing was what I was supposed to do. And so that's a generalist for you. Generalists are actually very good to have on your team, particularly if you have a small team. Um, it worked very well when I joined Linux New Media. We were opening the first, um, well, the only North American office. Um, and like I said, our parent office was in Munich. Um, but because I had a bunch of weird different skill set, that worked very well since we were going to have a very tiny team. There was two of us, the editor-in-chief and me. And um, I had a managing editor background. But I also um, could you know, build a website, a simple website. I'm not a webmaster. but. Um, and I could design a magazine, um, I could uh, manage an office, you know, edit, write, um, you know, but, and, and I, I adapt to well to change. I worked very well under pressure. That worked out well for us. Uh, I was able to pick up new skills quickly. I enjoyed that. And, um, you know, and, and I love the variety and learning on the job. But those are also um, some challenges, too. Um, it, like I said, it's very hard to show what you're doing if you're doing a whole bunch of you know, little things as opposed to, like, if I'm just managing a website and updating it, you know, um, I, I, that's harder to show. If, you know, if the news just shows up every day on there, well, I actually wrote it and posted it, you know, but it's not the same as rolling out a whole website, you know, and um, learning on the job is, it can also, um, you know, be hard because if you're busy trying to pick up skills, maybe you aren't producing at the same time or whatever you're supposed to be doing. And so it can certainly take longer to perform jobs. I, like I said, I can design a magazine, you know, from the beginning. Um, I'm not going to be fast at it, though. And it, it's probably not going to be technically perfect as if I were a regular designer. But if our regular designer was short on time and needed me to do some stuff that she could just polish at the end, that's where the skill came in handy. But what to write on the resume if you're a generalist can also be very tricky, which is why I custom write my resume for any position I was applying for. Because if I was applying for a you know, community management position, those would be the experiences I would want to make sure I highlighted as opposed to um, you know, being an editor. And that would be the same thing if you can do some programming and then some you know, community management or whatever. You would have different versions of your resume and cover letter. Um, the T-shaped generalist is something that um, I hadn't really heard about before until recently. And um, this is something that uh, employers tend to like more than just a generalist, somebody who has some, a couple of strengths, but then experience. So, you know, you've, you can do a bunch of these things, you have the skill set, but you're really strong in, you know, Python or, um, you know, fixing bugs or uh, whatever. Uh, finding bugs that no one else has ever seen is what I'm good at, but that doesn't look good on a resume. <laughs> Um, if you've seen Buffy, does anybody remember this episode? Hush might be the best episode of all. And it had, let's see, I think the 17 minutes of dialogue in a 44 minute long episode. And the gentlemen um, were the villains that came in and they stole everybody's voices. And so the whole episode was pretty silent, you know, and, and people were writing on little boards and <clears throat> doing some very funny hand gestures to communicate. And, um, so it was a really creepy episode, you know, but it had some moments of humor too. But 
that, that episode, and the gentleman made me think of harassment in our community. And, um, you know, I, I hear some people who, who will say they're tired of hearing about it, you know, and that's great. We all are, because we're tired of it happening, you know, and it still happens. Having been in this field a long time, I can tell you that it is better, you know. I haven't had anybody tell me to read the fucking manual in oh, more than a decade, um, and that's nice. <laughs> Um, instead, now they're talking about, why don't you write a better manual, you know? Or, as I told somebody, um, well, if it was intuitive, you know, and your user interface was more friendly, I wouldn't have to go read the manual. So, speaking up is not always possible with harassment, and this episode, you know, nicely illustrated that. Um, I, I had I, uh, at one time in particular that where I was harassed online by some 4chan people and I you know I was able to you know sleuth out which channel they were on and where they were plotting how to harass me and you know sharing my email address and and but then I also saw that they were eagerly awaiting my public response you know because it was in response to a blog I had written and so they were inundating it with you know these really nasty quotes you know and uh, uh, well it started off you know what get in the kitchen to make me a sandwich it always starts that way um, but then it, then it got really graphic and and the emails were they were very upsetting you know but um, I, I handled it in a way that I felt comfortable with. I shut down all the comments on all of our sites in English worldwide, so they all were, they had to be, you know, you know, previewed and approved after that. And all the bloggers actually were very happy about it. I was the only female blogger at the time, but the guys were all like, thank you, you know. And um, to this day, I think they still have that where you have to approve comments because I also felt like we were setting a tone, you know, for our site, and I wanted it to be a friendly, you know, place where people could leave uh, intelligent comments, and those would stay up, and then the sandwich comments would not get approved. Um, but yeah, with harassment, people just always can't talk about it. Uh, you know, workplace sexual harassment—that's a very tricky thing for people to um, to discuss. So when you're thinking, you know, well, our team's a great team or our community's a great community, I've never seen harassment or I've never heard about it, um, keep in mind that it, it still might be going on. And so if somebody else is talking about it, um, you know, saying I never hear about it, it's not saying anything at all because you might not hear about it and it still be going on. Um, talking about if, if you're harassed by somebody at work, for example, if this person's well-liked, you have the potential of losing um, allies at your job, you know, and um, uh, hurting yourself when it comes to being promoted or uh, even staying on a team, you know, and, and often it's the person who reports it that ends up having the fallout as, as opposed to the person who actually is doing the harassing. Online harassment is even worse. <laughs> it, um, you would think, I mean, people, I see it all the time, just ignore, you know, ignore it. Well, that's okay to say unless these people are saying some really disturbing things. I mean, you get threats, you know, and unless you've had those, and, um, you just don't realize. You feel differently when it's directed at you and you have somebody threatening to come to your home and do horrible things to you. Whether or not you think they know where you live or they'd actually follow through, it's still very disturbing. And generally, these people online aren't using their real names. Um, I don't know if they ever do, um, whereas they are, you know, my, my name's out there, you know, my phone number, my email. Um, you know, because generally people aren't doing this to me, but then you have these um, online harassers, and um, I, again, you, you know, people just don't always talk about it. Um, I'm seeing this go on in, in some communities online right now, um, this, the online harassment, and um, like I said, it's getting better, but we still have a long way to go when it comes to harassment. But I didn't want to end on that, because <laughs> that was where originally this ended, and I was like, wow, that's a bummer, um, because this was not supposed to be like that at all. Uh, Buffy's a really wonderful show, and so I do end with another villain, but um, Adam, for those of you uh, who have seen this series, um, is a, a great example of closed source development. Adam is uh, created you know, in, in the back rooms of, of a lab, um, and very, only a couple people know that he's being built, you know, and he's supposed to be the most perfect whatever, and so when they go to fight him, they don't even know what they're dealing with. They don't even know how he was built or what all, you know, abilities he has, so I thought he was a nice example, and then when I looked for quotes, I found the one where he says, I seem to have a design flaw, and I was like, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> um, so that was the last one I had, and, and uh, if anybody had other examples of, um, you know, because when I'm, when I'm seeing shows like this, or I, I wrote an article one morning, um, if you're, if you're, dog was a, a Linux, 
you know, or if your Linux was a dog, which breed would it be? And I wrote that in my head one morning having coffee. And so if, if you're like me and watching Buffy thinking, oh, that reminds me of, uh, I would love to hear any other suggestions you have of characters I left out. Any ideas? Nope. Well, for those of you who haven't seen Buffy, I encourage you to. It's still on Netflix, um, and uh, it's awesome. So, and thank you for coming to my talk. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.